So I've been working with JavaScript and TypeScript pretty much my whole web development career. Um, but over time, I just got really curious about how things actually work under the hood. Like I wanted to really get web development at the most fundamental level. And that's what kind of led me to this journey of building a web server in C. By the way, don't worry if you don't know C. This video is still for you. But my journey really started with me trying out Go. At the time, Go felt more low level compared to JavaScript. I knew I could go even lower, but writing a web server in C, surely that's just a waste of time, right? I mean, with C being so unsafe and all concerned with bits and bytes, I kept talking myself out of it, but the idea just kept coming back to me. I quickly realized that to write C, you need a basic understanding of how computers actually work. So uh, I figured that was a good place to start. After going over some basic computer science theory, I started experimenting with writing very simple programs in C and assembly, while also learning how the Linux kernel and hardware manage and execute them. After spending some time with these fundamentals, I decided it was time to start working on my C web server, which would end up including a template engine, async request handling, stack allocators, coroutines, and a DB connection pool. I have been using a Debian machine in GitHub code spaces as my development environment. Now, let me demonstrate the authentication system in action. To follow along with this video, it's important to understand these two key concepts in C, structs and pointers. Structs provide the program with information about how blocks of memory should be interpreted, and pointers are variables that store memory addresses. Now let's run the program with the debugger to see how everything fits together. First, I request the operating system to reserve a space in memory for my program to store data. Upon success, I receive the address where that reserved memory space is located, which I store in this arena global variable. I will also keep track of the addresses where different pieces of data will be stored in memory using the arena data global variable. To store data in memory, I write at the location where arena current is pointing. After writing, I move the arena current pointer forward so it's ready for the next write. I'll be doing this constantly throughout the program, either by using arena alloc or by manually modifying the address that arena current points to. Next, I load the environment variables from a .env file into a key value pair table stored in the memory arena. This table is a sequence of strings placed consecutively in memory, with each key followed by its corresponding value. I process the .env file line by line, ignoring empty lines, comments, and leading white space. For each valid key value pair, I extract the key and value as strings and store them in the memory arena. I can look up any value for a given key in the table using the find value function, which iterates through the memory, comparing each key to the provided key. If a match is found, it returns a pointer to the subsequent string, which is the value. There are also other handy functions for working with dictionaries, like the add key value function to insert new entries, or the get dictionary size function to check how many key value pairs it contains. Next, the load public files function loads public or static files like CSS or JSON into a dictionary. 
In this dictionary, each file's path acts as the key, and the file's content is stored as the value. This setup allows web clients to request files using their paths. A single handler function processes all these requests, effectively making the application function as a file server for these static resources. The web server will serve HTML that, combined with the HTMX library, allows you to build rich web applications without the need for much JavaScript on the client side. I store all the HTML components in the slash templates folder and the load templates function creates a dictionary to access them, similar to the load public files function, while resolving any inner component imports as needed. For component imports that use a self-closing tag, the resolution is done by recursively if needed, replacing the import statements with the corresponding HTML components. Imports that don't use a self-closing tag will contain one or more slots. Next, I configure the server socket to operate in non-blocking mode, preventing the program from getting stuck waiting on I.O. operations while sending or receiving data. By using ePoll, I register the socket to be monitored, and ePoll notifies me when the socket is ready for reading or writing, allowing the program to continue with other tasks without being blocked. You can learn more about ePoll here, but essentially it's a Linux kernel system call that enables Node.js to handle multiple requests concurrently in a single thread. After that, I establish multiple connections to my PostgreSQL database and configure the communication to be non-blocking as well. Again, using ePoll, I register these sockets for monitoring and receive notifications when they are ready for reading or writing. These connections are then stored in a connection pool which is essentially an array of available connections. Client requests that require querying the database can use any available connection from the pool, and once they're done, the connections are returned and become available for other requests. At this point, I no longer need the environment variables, so I erase them from memory for safety. After all this setup, I'm ready to handle client requests. In an infinite loop, I handle incoming notifications from ePoll, for server socket events, I accept new client requests to the web server. Client socket and DB socket events signal that their respective communication channels between the web server and the client or the web server and the PostgreSQL server are ready to send or receive data. When a new client request arrives, I set up a dedicated memory arena that will be used exclusively for the duration of that request. Once the communication channel between the web server and the client is ready, I pass the client request to the router, which reads the request and delegates it to the appropriate handler function. An HTTP request arrives as a stream of bytes that follow a specific structure. And since I know how the HTTP message is formatted, I can easily extract key values with the find HTTP request value function. Now let's see how the authentication system works in the account tab. When the user clicks on the account tab, the server receives a request, which is handled by the account get function. This function grabs an available connection from the pool to query the database and check whether the user has an active session using the isAuthenticated function. The isAuthenticated function checks if a session ID cookie was sent in the request headers and queries the database to verify whether the session is still active. Since querying the database takes some time, the code execution returns to the main loop to check for other notifications from ePoll. Meanwhile, the main loop will notify us when the database response is ready. Once the response is ready, execution returns to where we left off in the isAuthenticated function, and the request handling continues. This concept of allowing execution to be suspended and resumed is called a coroutine. 
If the user has a valid session, we return HTML for the user profile. Otherwise, we return HTML, prompting the user to authenticate using their email. Now we can enter an email and click Continue. This triggers a POST request to the AuthCheck email endpoint, which validates the email and returns HTML with an error message if the input doesn't match the correct email format. If the email matches the expected format, we return a new login or registration view, depending on whether the email is already registered in the database. The view also includes the provided email embedded in the HTML. After sending the response to the client, we clean up the resources used by the request, such as the client socket, memory arena, and database connection. And that's it. Um, by the way, this is not my real voice. I decided to use an AI-generated voice for my first video while I do some more practicing with my own.